Okay, so here we are. It's Tuesday the 27th, and this is the third week of Biology 106. We're going to pick up with the last little bit of Chapter 14, uh, which is uh, after all the brain structures, just a quick review of the cranial nerves. You sure already know the cranial nerves, but we need to be reminded of those, especially the ones that are related to the lab exam this week. Then we'll be moving into Chapter 16, which is over the special senses, and that should integrate nicely with what you learned last week in lab. Uh, we have uh, this week to finish up Chapter 16, and then wherever we are at the end of Thursday, we'll mark the material for exam number one. That exam will be when next week from today, right? And it will cover water and fluid balance, Chapter 24. Uh, chapter 12 over the neuron and action potentials, chapter 14 over the brain, and 16 over the senses. So largely over the nervous system. Uh, that will be a full-length exam. I did make an error, uh, shocking, uh, on Connect. I've, some students noticed it already and have already stressed out a little bit about it. Um, I forgot to tell you that on Connect, I have put a quiz that is related to exam, lab exam one. Now, those who have already taken it or who have lab exam tonight, do not worry about it. I'll have you do this over the next week. It'll just be good edification and, and confirmation of what you know. Those who have the lab exam on Thursday, if you want to, you could go and get this quiz done in advance of the exam. It's meant to be a review to help you. It's not going to be a deal breaker. Um, but it will go through some histology and remind you of some nerves, things like that. Oh, come on. But you'll find it in the connect, OK? I can't get in right now. Here we go. So in Connect, uh, you'll see it's going to say quiz for lab exam. If it lets us in. OK, you'll see it. OK, so I'll extend that for a week. And those who have already taken the lab exam, go ahead and do that quiz. It's five points. Uh, it'll help you just review some things uh, after you've taken the exam. And for those who are yet to take it, it will uh, help you in your preparation. So take a look at that. I'll, I'll send out an email as a reminder about that. Okay. Um, okay, so cranial nerves. What do we know and what, do, what have we forgotten? I'm not asking you to know any more or less about them than what you already were responsible for in Biology 105. So you need to know your 12 cranial nerves. You need to know them by number and by name. Uh, you need to be able to recognize uh, what they're responsible for doing, right? What part of the body are they controlling? Are they a motor nerve? That is, they only are responsible for movement. Are they a sensory-only nerve? That is, they're only receiving sensory information. Or are they considered a mixed nerve? That is, they are both uh, motor and sensory. So I'm just going to quickly go through these and just tell you that <laughs> sensory nerves are one two, and eight. One, two, and eight, those are the three sensory nerves. That may help you as you categorize these things. The five motor-only nerves are three, four, six, nine, sorry, that's 11, and 12. Okay, now those are the motor-only nerves. And then the ones that are mixed are the rest of them, five, seven, nine, and 10. So in, in the past, I gave you a mnemonic or two to help you look at these. Um, if you're not sure of how to, those mnemonics, let me know. <coughs> I won't ask you to identify them structurally here, uh, but they are basically numbered in anatomical order from the olfactory nerve being closest to the frontal lobe and most anterior back toward uh, the 12th nerve. Uh, the only real flip there is that the 11th and 12th nerve actually flip places. I don't care that you know that, but they are largely in anatomical order, and I would never point to a nerve here and say, 
which nerve is that. You should, however, though, recognize one important anatomical structure, and that is this big crossing over region, and that is what? That's the optic chiasm, and you read about in lab the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It must be what? A gray area, right? A nucleus just a above, right? Supra of this chiasm. So that is the optic nerve. And then what are these guys up here? Look like antenna? Those are the olfactory nerves, right? And in lab, you'll be seeing tonight or Thursday that right next to the, the uh, Christogali, up in the frontal lo bone, there are little openings, little holes in the cribriform plate, and those little openings are called the olfactory foramina. And it's through those little openings that the hair cells go down and allow you to smell, right? The nerve endings are now in your muco mucus uh, of your nasal passages. Okay. So again, really, really quick, olfactory nerve. When I say these nerves, you need to have almost an immediate recall. Is that a sensory nerve? Is that a motor nerve? Is it a mixed nerve? And what does it do? So when I say olfactory, you say smell sensory, right? Smell sensory. When I say two, you say optic vision sensory, right? It's only the sensation of sight. Number three, ocular motor. It must be a motor nerve. And what does it do? It moves the eye in a very particular way. It moves the eye up and down. Um, it allows you to look toward your nose if you're looking cross-eyed. It also allows you to open and close um, uh, blink. The blink reflex is also here. Uh, number four, trochlear nerve also moves the eye in a particular way. Which way? Down and out. So to look at your hands in anatomic position, if you can, while looking straight, if you can glimpse down at your palms, then your trochlear nerve is working fine. Motor only. And then the trigeminal nerve, number five, it kind of interrupts this whole sequence. The trigeminal, tri, three regions. Those three regions, forehead, mandibular, or maxillary and mandibular, those three areas for you to feel, so it's sensory, but it's also motor in what? This is the muscle, or the, the nerve that allows you to chew. So this is your chewing muscle. Abducens, the word abduct in here. So this allows you to do what? Look peripherally, right? To abduct your eyes, to look to the left and to the right. Motor. Number seven, facial nerve. Allows you to make funny faces, that it controls the motor movement of your facial muscles. But it also what? Taste, right? On the front two-thirds, the anterior two-thirds of your tongue. If you had damage to this nerve, you wouldn't have, you'd have trouble with your sagging facial muscles. You'd also have dif difficulty with tasting some sensations. Uh, there are five branches to this nerve. I don't ask you to know these, but if you, this was the only cranial nerve, only one of the cranial nerves in lab you had to know, and you saw it branching all over the face, didn't you? Okay, the, fa the facial nerve. Uh, number eight. Vestibular cochlear nerve, older books call it the auditory nerve. This is both balance and hearing. It is sensory only. Number nine, glossopharyngeal. Glosso means tongue, pharynx, the throat. So back deep, back of your throat, in your, in your tonsil area, if you will. Uh, this is taste in the back of your mouth, but it's also your gag reflex. So this is motor and sensory. The vagus nerve wanders far, far away, wanders all the way from your head down into your gut. So it's the longest nerve. It is a sensory nerve, but there's also some motor function in that your ability to speak, to control your larynx uh, is here. So if you have hoarseness or loss of voice, if you had cut or damaged your vagus nerve. Number 11, the accessory nerve is a motor nerve that allows you to shrug your shoulders and turn your head. So it's going to your sternocleidomastoid. It's going to your trapezius muscle. And then finally, the hypoglossal under the tongue is heading to allow you basically to move your tongue around to, it helps with speech, doesn't it? Uh, if you can't, if you don't have a tongue, you can't speak uh, very well. Uh, so it's going to help with food manipulation, roll, roll food around and stick your tongue out at your friends. Okay. So that's what's going on with the hypoglossal. So that's just a really quick review of your cranial nerves. Remind me of one of the mnemonics that maybe you remember. 
There's a couple of different mnemonics. One is for the first name, first letter of the name of the nerves. Give me one of those mnemonics really loud. Yeah, so say it again for me. I'm going to put change colors here. So, yeah, Os Oscars, old, ostrich, tasted tomatoes, and felt very good. Vomited and how, uh, yeah. So what do each of those represent? First letter of the nerves, right? Is that right? Oh, because I can't spell or whatever? Yeah. It's okay. Okay. That makes more sense. I don't know that one. but I, I, I just know them. I haven't figured out a mnemonic that works for me. Now, what's another mnemonic that you might want to remember? That's just the first letter of the nerves. Another mnemonic that might help you remember what they're doing is what? Some, Some say marry money, but my brother says big boats matter more. Now, what is that mnemonic helping you? In order, right, sensory, motor, or both, okay, in 1 through 12. So some say marry money, but my brother says big boats matter more. Um, some say Marilyn Monroe, but my brother says Bridget Bardot, mm -mm, whatever, right? There are lots of them out there. So that one is, I do remember that one because that one does help me remember, if I think about it, what does each of those nerves do, at least is it motor or it sensory, it might help you out. So keep those mnemonics in mind, and um, that finishes up chapter 14. Anything at all related to brain, uh, the neuron, action potentials, anything in 12 or 14 that needs to be restated or cl clarified? Okay. Well, let's move on to chapter 16. I think you'll find this to be very comfortable. So chapter 16, continuing with the nervous system. Now we're moving on to the sense organs. Uh, we'll start off with touch, and then we'll move into taste and smell. And I'm hoping to get through hearing today. And that should leave us with equilibrium and vision, which has the most information for us to deal with on Thursday. Um, Again, if I fall short on this, whatever I don't finish will not be on the exam or will be bonus on the exam, depending upon my mood, and I'll make that announcement. So, uh, you know, we've, we've got the parts of the brain. We've got, uh, we've got action potentials. We know now what happens. Uh, the signal is sent down the axon. Now we've got to figure out some of the pathways. Why is it that the brain can perceive light versus hearing versus balance information versus taste or smell? So let's figure this out together. And um, again, these sensory inputs are obviously vital for our overall well-being, for our intellectual function. We try to get our kids right to be stimulated by music and light and sounds. We know that being visually and sensory stimulated is important for the development of the nervous system and for our overall well-being. Uh, we also know that um, this information that comes in, the sensory information that comes in, can influence our overall well-being. It can influence our blood pressure. It can influence our, our, our um, muscle tension, all sorts of things, right? The idea of relaxation. And what does that mean for you? Is that music? Is it sight? Is it sound? Whatever it is that may help you with your overall well-being as well. So every one of your senses requires a receptor. This is old. We got this. There are different types of receptors that receive this incoming information. Those could be photoreceptors. They could be chemoreceptors. They could be mechanoreceptors. Uh, we've discussed a little bit about those in the past. They are all going to uh, be protected somewhat in the body. Uh, some of these nerve endings are just very raw nerve endings, very much a free nerve ending. We find those in our skin, but a large number of our special senses are 
housed in, they're so important to our overall well-being that these nerve endings and these receptors are housed in a very well-protected <coughs> vessel. Think the eye, think the ear, think the cochlea, the semicircular canals. Um, so we, we've got to protect the senses um, as much as possible. And then there's transduction. What, what kind of signal is it, right? It's a photoreceptor that does what? Light is perceived by the photoreceptors in the retina, and then what happens? An action potential sent, right? Or touch is perceived, or sound waves bend hair cells, and as those hair cells are bent, what happens? An action potential is sent, right? The same old action potential that we've been talking about. Or maybe um, sodium or glucose molecules on the tongue and the taste buds. Again, triggers those receptors and sends off an action potential. So we've got to figure out how is it that we convert light and heat and sound, right, hot and cold thermoreceptors in the skin. How do we take this information and convert it into a, quote, nerve signal? Whenever you see the word nerve signal, you know that means an action potential. If it's traveling down a single neuron, if it were traveling down an entire nerve, we would call it a what? Compound action potential, which we were introduced to a little bit in lab. And um, then there's going to be a, <coughs> a receptor potential. Now, when I said the word potential in the past, what, what has that meant to you? Potential. Resting membrane potential was a what? Difference in the inside and outside electrical charge of the cell. Uh, we know that neurons are electrically stimulated, therefore they have a resting membrane potential. We're going to see in the next unit that muscle cells also are excitable and therefore also have a resting membrane potential. Um, but here the word receptor potential is referring more to, if I tickle it a little bit, it's only going to activate a few nerve endings or a few uh, action potentials. And if I have more light or more touch or more sound, then I will bring about even greater stimulus. So the idea of receptor uh, potential is how light, how little light can I see to send off a action potential? Right? How little sound can I hear to <coughs> activate the nerve ending to be fired? And then, obviously, when that, nerve, when that nerve signal goes down to the axon terminus, what happens there? That's where neurotransmitters were released, right? So again, we're, we're trying to put all these pieces and parts together to this thing called the nervous system. And then we become aware of it, or maybe not. Maybe we don't become aware of the stimulus. Maybe it's being dealt with just by our involuntary or our unconsciousness. But regardless, our nervous system is going to receive this information. We may not become consciously aware of it, but it's definitely our central nervous system has become aware of it, if I, if I want to use that same word. So most of this information will be filtered out by your brainstem. Most of it does not require your conscious awareness. So whenever we're discussing a receptor, we have to keep these four characteristics in place or, or kinds of information. Number one, the modality. Fancy word for saying what kind of signal is it? Is it light? Is it chemicals? Is it touch? Is it stretch? A location. Where in the body are these particular receptors found? You only have photoreceptors in your eye, right? You don't have photoreceptors elsewhere. The intensity. What is it that when the light comes in or that chemical comes in, how much of it's necessary to initiate the signal? And then finally, the duration. Um, is it going to be a signal that never stops sending you a signal, or is it one that sort of poops out after a while? So that comes back to intensity and duration kind of go together. Let's talk about each of these at a time. Modality, the type of stimulus, what sort of sensation produces this action potential. So now we're thinking photoreceptors, right, or mechanoreceptors, or chemoreceptors, or maybe stretch receptors, which are a kind of touch mechanoreceptor. Okay. And uh, what has to happen is that, remember, every action potential is the same. Th this is kind of mind-numbing in a way. When you think about it, you know, every action potential going down your neurons is exactly the same. There isn't a different kind of action potential for light information versus a different kind of action potential for a 
chemical signal or a different type of action potential for a, um, some sort of sound wave. It's, it's all the same, right? Every action potential is exactly the same. So the brain has to figure out, okay, what triggered that? Where is the pathway? What, wh literally, where is that nerve traveling from? Where is it starting? And where is it ending up in the brain? And then interpret those signals in a meaningful way. Again, location. Um, another word for location is the receptive field. In lab last week, we discussed the receptive field regarding touch, that there were larger receptive fields or smaller receptive fields, and that was your sense of touch with those two-point discrimination tests. We could have also done hot and cold. If I touch you with something warm, there are some places where you will not feel the warm because there isn't a thermoreceptor in that area. Likewise, I could touch you in a localized area with something very cold, and you may not perceive the cold temperature again because you don't have a cold uh, receptor in that localized area. So that's the receptive field. And we did the two-point discrimination test in lab. And then if I said receptive field for vision, where's your receptive field for vision? It's only in the eye, right? And there's a dense number of these photoreceptors found in your retina. And then the brain has to figure out this projection or this uh, pathway. So we'll be talking about these pathways as we discuss each of the senses today and Thursday. I'll discuss to you a projection pathway from where does it begin and where is it going in the brain. And this will help us understand how the brain interprets all this. Then there's intensity of the signal. The brain looks at this in three different ways. Which fibers are sending signals? How many fibers are sending the signals? The more fibers might suggest more stimulus. And how rapidly are they coming at you? So the brain has to figure out if, if you're looking at a bright light or you're listening to a, lo a loud sound versus a soft sound, how does the brain pick up differences in volume of sound and how does it send those signals to the brain for you to perceive that, whoa, that's too loud or that's not loud enough. Okay. So that's all the intensity deal. And then duration, how long does the whole thing last? How long does it last? So this is going to be a changing in the frequency of the action potentials. Some senses adapt. Some senses do not. So for, this, for the sake of smell, right? We know that if someone sits down, to you, down next to you and they have a pleasant cologne on, assuming you don't have any super sensitivities to cologne, you may notice it for a moment, but then a couple minutes later, you no longer are aware of it because oftentimes this sense of smell adapts, okay? It phases out. Other senses, we would never want them to become adaptable or comfortable. Your sense of um, balance, your vision never gets to take a break, right? Whereas your, your nose can take a break and adapt to the environment, you would never want your eyes to kind of go into a, 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 a down phase. So let's talk about these two words, phasic and tonic. Phasic, again, initially you are aware of it, so you sit down, you smell their perfume, you're aware of it, but very shortly thereafter, your nasal, your olfactory nerve adapts to that smell, and you're really no longer aware of it. You're only aware of it until somebody else sits down to you with a different odor. Right? And then you become consciously aware of it for a second, and then it phases away. But then other, um, and that's also, not only is it smell, it's also cutaneous pressure. If you put on a watch, the moment you put your watch on, you're aware of that tactile feeling. Um, but then shortly thereafter, you're no longer even consciously aware that you have a watch on, or your glasses, or a ring. Those things kind of phase out. They're phasic receptors. Whereas some receptors adapt slowly, if at all, and this would be, um, thankfully, proprioception, right? Now, what does that word proprioception mean? That's an important word. Yeah, the ability for you to know where you are, if you will, right, in your body space. It also, not only is it awareness of your body position, but part of that information is coming back from your joint spaces, uh, your ligaments, your tendons, the stretch receptors in those places are also sending signals back to you. Your muscle, how tense it is, 
all of that is being sent back to your brain and is being perceived and integrated as this thing called proprioception. That never gets to quiet down, right? That's going to keep going. Your vision, your hearing, those are also largely uh, non-adaptable. In lab, you saw something like this with the two-point discrimination. Who wants to describe this to me? What's this slide showing me? We take a, take a stab at this. Ooh, that's a bad word, stab, right? So here's that two-point, right, that little compass. The distance is the same on both, right? But this is taken from the back. Now, in the back, there aren't that many touch receptors. So you may have one neuron that is responsible for a big area of skin. So you may perceive those two pokes as a single poke. You wouldn't be able to tell it as two distinct pokes. Whereas, if you took that same instrument, same distance apart, push with the same intensity, but you were doing so in your fingers, because there are a large number, a greater density of these touch receptors, you would have no difficulty. In fact, there could be you know, multiple neurons that are responsible for the sensation of touch in that area. So you would have no difficulty saying, oh, that neuron's fired on the left hand, and another neuron is feeling that sensation on the right side. So that's receptive field, two-point discrimination. Now, I've already mentioned we're going to re uh, dis discuss receptors by their <coughs> modality. The words here, and if I, if I say the word, you should recognize them. So thermoreceptors would measure what? Respond to or measure temperature, hot, cold, temperature changes. Photoreceptors, light, nociceptors, pain. Right? It's a special kind of sensation. Uh, chemoreceptors, chemicals, mechanoreceptors, touch or movement of some sort. Okay? Then we can talk about where are these stimuli originating? Where is the receptor? Well, the receptor could be considered extraceptor because it's positioned in such a place that it's receiving external stimuli. Or the receptor could be interoceptors because it's positioned in such a way that it's collecting internal or visceral information. And then finally, proprioceptors are specifically positioned so that they are picking up body sensation and movement position stuff. stuff. Yes, sir? All of your special senses are going to be extraceptors, okay? Um, because you are perceiving, so vision, smell, touch, all that is coming from the outside. Intro receptors, I ate too much, my stomach is being stretched. My bladder is full, my bladder is being stretched. Um, those are two simple examples of introceptors. Um, you may recall that your heart has baroreceptors that are measuring excessive blood pressure. Those would be another example of an introceptor. Okay. And then, again, where are they distributed? Your general senses are distributed all over the place. When you hear the word general sense, I want you to think touch. Touch is the only general sense. Your other senses are special senses, and all of them originate in the head, and all of them are associated with cranial <laughs> nerves. So we're back to our cranial nerves again. So all of the special senses, vision, right, seeing, you might hear audition used to describe hearing. You might hear equilibrium or balance. Another funky word for taste is gustation, right? I'll use that word again in a moment. And then smell would be right, olfaction, right? The ability to smell would be olfaction or the olfactory nerves involved. Now, now we get to this idea of pathways pathways. We described in chapter 12 that the nervous system is not a single neuron that goes from one end of the body, a direct wire connection to the brain, but instead the nervous system is set up in series of neurons. So your senses are no different. They are going to have usually, not all, big word right here, most, and I'll get to the, I'll get to the uh, one that's not the 
the same. Mm -hmm. But most of your senses are going to have three neurons in the pathway. Okay, three neurons in the pathway. The first neuron is called the first order neuron. It's also the afferent neuron. What does that tell us? It's the neuron that has directly received the stimulation. That could be the photoreceptor, that could be the mechanoreceptor, that could be the chemoreceptor. Okay. Now, where does that thing go? If it's a touch receptor on our body, somewhere in our arms or legs or our trunk, that signal is going to go from the body and go where? To the spinal nerves, to, to, to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. I need you to think back what that means. Remember, the signals are coming in, spinal nerves. Incoming information always goes, afferent goes toward the dorsal horn, right? And there, that's where that neuron is going to end, isn't it? Now, there in the spinal cord, there would be another neuron. That would be the second order neuron. You might know it also as an interneuron, but that's going to be the second order neuron, and that is going to travel up the spinal cord. It's going to travel up the spinal cord in a tract. What's a tract? I'm pulling a lot of vocab out. What's a tract? A tract is what we call nerves in the central nervous system. Right? Nerves are only where? In the periphery. A tract, T-R-A-C-T, a tract is a bundle of fibers right, that travel through the central nervous system, and that neuron is going to travel as part of a tract, and somewhere along the way, as it travels up the spinal cord, it will <laughs> decussate. That is, it will what? Cross over to the opposite side, and it will go as far as the thalamus. That's where the second order neuron will stop. Can you picture the thalamus? That pit, the core, that big center region, we're not yet up in the cerebrum, are we? Now we're in the brain stem in the, in the diencephalon region. And then it's from there that a third order neuron will take the signal from the thalamus and go to the cerebrum. Okay? So three neurons involved with your senses. One that comes in and goes to the spinal cord. The second one goes up the spinal cord to the thalamus. The third one takes it from the thalamus to your association area or the cortical region of your brain, and we've been learning about those. We know that there are certain parts of the brain that receive visual information, smell, right, sensory information. Okay. Now, what if it's not coming from your body? Back up to first order. It could be coming from your head, right, sensory information on your face, though. Where, do you get, where is this information coming from? This isn't, this isn't going to your, is this facial or is this trigeminal? Yeah, feeling on my face is trigeminal. This information isn't going back to my spinal cord, is it? But it is going back to my pons and my medulla via what cranial nerve? Trigeminal number? Five. Okay, number five. Now, these are mostly... Look at this. Most of these first-order neurons, touch, pressure, proprioception, are large myelinated axons. That tells you that that signal is traveling very, very fast. Whereas your heat and cold and some of your pain, I'll add that on there as well, some of your pain uh, uh, signals are traveling on smaller, unmyelinated, therefore they are slower. Okay, slower. Okay, that's a lot to absorb and a lot of words. But the pictures are going to come here in a moment, and I think it's going to help you. But senses, most of them, three neurons. First order, from the outside of the body to the spinal cord or to the pons or the medulla, if it's dealing with the face. And then second order from the spinal cord or the pons to the thalamus and the third order from the thalamus to that particular region of the brain that receives that kind of information. So let's talk first about pain. Okay, the pathway for pain. What's going on with this? Why do we need pain? Is pain a good thing? 
It's not good when it's happening, but man, it's an awfully important sense to have to avoid more danger, to avoid more uh, damage to the body. Um, now, there are examples where people no longer have a sensation of pain. Diabetics uh, can uh, have exasperations with neuropathy, and they no longer have a sensation of pain. Well, what happens to those patients if they're not very, very careful? They don't feel pain, so they put on a shoe that has a pebble in it, and that pebble eats away at their skin. They don't sense that discomfort, and so it festers and becomes a very infected, can be a, a real problem, uh, as one example. There are some other conditions where, uh, there are some genetic conditions, where people actually don't have a sense of pain, and they self-mutilate. Uh, people who do self-mutilate, it's possible they even have a, a, a lower threshold of pain. Okay, so there's all sorts of things going on here with pain. Um, the kinds of receptors that receive pain are the nociceptors. We've already said that word. And there are two basic flavors of nociceptors, fast and slow. Okay? And just like you would imagine, the fast is going to travel very, very quickly. These are going to be sharp, stabbing. You know, we've all experienced a, a bad injury, and that really hurts, goes very, very fast. But there are also more slow pathways where you get more of a throbbing, not so much the sharp pain, but more of a throbbing, long-lasting, more of a diffuse pain rather than acute localized pain. That's oftentimes more of a slow uh, type of pain receptor. Now, pain can be coming from a couple different places. It can be somatic or visceral as the name suggests, from the surface, from your body. That could be from your skin, your muscles, your joints, or it could be coming from your gut. It could be coming from your blood, or it could be coming from some other place. Um, what sorts of things send visceral signals? Stretch, my bladder's full, my stomach's full, my heart is being stretched, there's too much blood, blood pressure's too high. Or it could be an irritant, um, there could be a chemical irritant, stomach acid, for example, right? that stomach acid could be sending up a visceral response, heartburn, or there could be a lack of oxygen going to a tissue, in which case that organ's becoming ischemic or doesn't have enough oxygen. Think now heart attack, right? So during a heart attack, the cardiac muscle is not receiving enough oxygen, and there is a pain associated with that. So these are different types of pain signals, and um, typically an injured tissue will start releasing chemicals that stimulate the pain fibers, and one of the most potent pain stimuli known is bradykinin. Okay. Now, what does bradykinin break down to in kind of a way? It ends in IN, so it's a protein. Um, slow, kinetic, maybe, right? I don't know that it breaks down perfectly, but you just want to get a word in there somehow. Or maybe watching the Brady Bunch is painful. I, I don't know, right? A Brady kind. And so, but these, these chemicals are going to make us aware that we are in hurting situations. And so they become aware. They um, also, though, not only does it make us aware of the pain, it also begins the healing process. So these molecules are going to start the healing process, and they're going to bring in molecules like histamine, now, when you hear histamine, you might think first, I'm having an allergic reaction and I'm, my nose is running. Yes, but histamines are also vasodilators. So whenever you see the word histamine in anywhere in this course, it's probably okay for you to think, oh, that is a vasodilator. And what would that do? Think about pain and think about healing. Vasodilation would bring more blood to the area of the pain uh, which would be a good thing, right? Bring more healing to the area of injury. Uh, prostaglandins um, and serotonin also are molecules we'll talk more about later on. We've already mentioned serotonin as a neurotransmitter in passing, and prostaglandins uh, we'll see are also involved with pain mediation as we go through the course. So how does this work? How do we perceive pain? Well, first... Let's talk about pain signals from your head, okay? So the first order neuron, right, is going to be somewhere. Um, it's going to bring that pain in, and where is it going? First order neuron 
is going to go to the central nervous system, but it's going to get there through either some spinal nerves, right, um, or it's going to go through some cranial nerves. And let's think about these. Five. Trigeminal sensations on the face. Seven. Nine. I just burned my tongue. Right? You get it 79 or taste, right? But also your tongue. So sensations to your tongue. I just burned my tongue. Ouch. Or 10. Gag. Something in the back of my throat kind of thing, right? So those are a sore throat, right? Those are all pain signals coming from the face, the tongue, the throat. The second order neuron is then going to go, um, so it's going to go into the, uh, into the spinal nerve or the cranial nerve. And then the second order neuron is going to decussate. And where does it go? They always go to the thalamus, right? And then third order neuron is going to go up where? It's going to reach the post-central gyrus. You know that better as the sensory strip that says, ouch, right? I just perceived pain. So you've got a signal going from the face to the thalamus and then up to your sensory strip. So that's if the signal is coming from your head. If instead it's coming from the neck down, it's really not much different, except now we have some different names for it. And I want to make you aware of these three ascending tracks. Three ascending tracks. Now, what's that word track mean again to you? Not a, it's sort of like a nerve within the spinal cord, right? It is a bundle of axons traveling through the spinal cord. And there are three of these. One is the spinal thalamic track. Okay, you tell me, what's it doing? Going from the spine to the thalamus. Okay, no shock there. The second one, spinal reticular, from the spinal cord up to the reticular formation, which you know is in the medulla. And then the gracial fasciculus, this one is going to go up for, this is a particular uh, pathway for visceral pain. Okay, for visceral pain. So let's back up. Most of your pain signals from your body, from your neck down, are going to be carried by this spinal thalamic tract. There will be some that will go up to the spinal reticular tract. Again, it's going up to the reticular formation. Here you're thinking, oh, that's what? Reticular formation is part of your medulla. It's part of your most basic things like emotional, behavioral responses to pain. And then... Uh, Gracile fasciculus is going to go for visceral pain, right? My um, stomach, right? My gut. Something is hurting internally. Let's look at a picture. Pull all this together. So in this diagram, um, I'm putting my finger down on a tack for some unknown reason, right? And this is now going to trigger the first order neuron. There are going to be no C-ceptors in my skin, and that signal is going to travel where? What's this little dude right here? That is the soma for this sensory neuron. Remember, this is a, all those sensory neurons are what sort of neuron? Unipolar. Remember this conversation? I haven't, convert, I haven't pulled this out of the data bank this semester, right? But those are some ideas maybe from 105. So those are unipolar neurons. And the signal goes where? It comes in. It goes in the, the dorsal side. And there it synapses, right? So there it's going to synapse with a second-order neuron. You know it as an interneuron. It is going to take that signal. And in this case, it decussates immediately. That is, it goes right across the gray commissure and decussates to the other side of the spinal cord, and that second, nor second order neuron is going to go up, and where is it going? It's going to go right up to the thalamus, if it is the spinothalamic tract, or, and then what happens from there, the thalamus is going to go up where? To the sensory strip. Now, if instead it's going to go up this other route, this is the reticular formation, so it's just another name, and it's also going to go up to the sensory strip, isn't it? But it doesn't go to the thalamus, it instead stopped in at the reticular formation, and that was for some of the emotional re responses to pain. And then um, 
the third pathway, um, I don't even think it's even showing on this particular diagram. Okay? But what do you see? Three neurons. Everybody see the three neurons? Okay, so pain, three neurons going on here. Those are all... Say it again for me. Oh, do they all fire at the same time? Yeah, there will be some firing of all. Most of your body is going to go up the spinal th thalamic tract, okay? So there will be some going up the reticular tract. Now, there, again, the, the th thalamic tract is telling you about the actual sensation of pain. The reticular formation is going more to your limbic response. It's going to go to your, your uh, emotional responses to the pain, okay? And then... Um, the, the third one is more of a visceral response, which is why it's not shown here, because you just stuck your finger on a pin. This is not a visceral response. That's why the, the fasciculus isn't showing here. Why are they both going up then? They're both going up on the, in this case, let's say this is the, for the, this is the left finger, whatever, okay? And this is going to be going up the right side of the spinal cord, both of them, because it's going to cross over immediately. Now, where these signals cross over is really outside the scope of this course. I'm not going to have you memorizing all of this. Where does it cross over? But I assure you a neurologist knows this, right? A doctor knows, do pain signals cross over at the level of the spinal cord, or do they wait to go up into the brain stem before they cross over? Because a big impact on your testing of pain and your perception of pain, if you hurt somewhere, they need to be able to track down where that pain might be coming from. Now, referred pain. We know this term as well. Referred pain is what? Give me an example of referred pain. Having a heart attack, Having a heart attack and feeling pain down the left arm. Most often, not always, right? Some people don't perceive that at all. They feel like they've got some indigestion. Other people have a little backache. But we, we know that more classically, the pain travels down the left arm. Now, why is that? What's going on? The, the nervous system's kind of confused in a way. Because remember that spinal nerves are receiving information not only from your external, remember the areas of your skin are called the dermatomes, not only are each of your spinal nerves receiving external information, but they're also receiving visceral information. So when it comes to the heart, the heart is being innervated internally by T1 to T5. Okay. So the heart internally is sending signals that are going and being perceived by thoracic 1 through thoracic 5. Well, it turns out when you look at a dermatome map, T1 and T2 are going right down the arm and the left pectoral region. So that thoracic region, T1, T2, and T1 goes down and mediates down a little bit around the left arm as well. So the brain's kind of confused. It, it's the heart's in trouble, the heart's ischemic, the heart's not getting the oxygen it needs, so it sends out flares, basically, pain signals, but you perceive it a little bit also on the skin because your, your nervous system's receiving this SOS call, and it can't tell necessarily, is it coming from the heart or is it coming from the skin, right? And that's the idea of referred pain. The pain can be anywhere to a point. I mean, there has to be the, the, the nerves have to be involved with this situation, but some of us are wired just a little bit differently. I'll just put it that way. Right, none at all. None at all. Or there can be oh, a little indigestion or a little lower back pain. There's some, there's some different symptomology. And women are prone to some of those other phenomena. Men are more classically pectoral region, left, left arm. Uh, women don't always perceive that. They'll perceive back pain. Um, some of it just has to do with the wiring of our nervous system. Look at this map of referred pain areas. Don't memorize it, but it gives you a sense of what we're dealing with here. So if I were to pull out a dermatome map, you would see that T1 through T5 serve the pectoral region, and T1 goes down the arm as well. So that's where you would feel that referred pain in the classic heart attack sensation. If you were having um, appendicitis, you might sense pain here. If you were having a urinary bladder infection, not only anteriorly but posteriorly. 
If you were having a gallbladder attack, you might sense that problem here, but you might also feel it in the right shoulder. Okay. So people with gallbladder attacks sometimes will be complaining about pain in their right shoulder, the neck region, and it's actually referred pain back to the gallbladder. Okay, so how do we, what does the body do when it perceives a pain signal? What are some natural things we can do and what are some pharmacological things we can do to overcome this? So analgesics, right, pain relievers, um, we know that they, they work in the CNS. Uh, they're, they're working on these receptors for opium and morphine and heroin. These medications are, are given pharmacologically to, to kill pain. Uh, people take them to kill pain for other reasons. Um, and there are a couple other molecules that I want you to at least hear about. One is the endorphins. Who's ever experienced endorphins? Okay, Mary, I know you have as a long-distance runner, right? What are endorphins? Molecules that we now know are released from our own body when... Yeah, the runner is high, right? Uh, when the body is beginning to really have some painful signals sent, but the body can mask it by sending out these endorphins. And these endorphins are the runner's high. They can um, mask that pain, and they're very, very potent. There are also some endogenous opioids, again, internally produced opium-like molecules. And again, the endorphins are part of those families. And kephalins are another group that you'll hear about. So in kephalins, endorphins, um, you may hear me mention again, I won't mention uh, dinorphins. They're not on my list, they're not my top 10, but you may hear endorphins or enkephalins. Again, these are going to be naturally occurring painkillers that your own body produces. They're secreted by the central nervous system. They're secreted by the pituitary gland, uh, by the digestive tract, other organs, and We've mentioned this in passing before, and that is neuromodulators. Okay, neuromodulators. This is how they work. These molecules and kephalins are neuromodulators. If I say that word, does any picture come to mind? Neuromodulators. I had, you know, I, I, I said that there were modulators which could what? Influence positively or negatively our nervous system, and I use the words what? Inhibition and facilitation, right? Facilitation or inhibition were a way that where one neuron could influence another neuron, could release certain neurotransmitters, which could either increase or decrease the ability of that neuron to communicate with the next cell in the sequence. So let's take a look. Um, at this idea of spinal gating. It's all part of the same story. So what do these analgesics do, these naturally occurring analgesics do? Well, they stop the pain signal at the posterior horn. So what does this tell us? Is the first order neuron sending in the pain? Yes. So the first order neuron is saying, yeah, this hurts, dummy, right? And whatever that signal is coming, the nociceptor is definitely being fired, and it's going into the posterior or dorsal horn, but there the signal is being interfered with. It is being modulated by this idea of spinal gating, and this is where those analgesic fibers, they run, they descend down, they arise up in the brainstem. So let's unpack a couple more words. When I say fibers, what's another word for fibers here? Remember, a nerve fiber is an axon. So these would be signals coming down from your brain. They are fibers. What do fibers release? Neurotransmitters. In this case, these particular descending analgesic fibers, what do they release? Enkephalons and endorphins. Okay? And they are going to be released where? They're going to come down. The spinal cat tract is going to be descending, and they're going to block the ability of those pain signals to go up on the second order neuron. Okay, they're going to block that second order neuron from firing upward. How do they know to release that if the signal hasn't gone up? 
well, the signal was going up. The question was, how do these uh, analgesic fibers know to do their job? Okay, there was pain, right? I mean, y you were perceiving pain. It was coming in, first order, going up the spinal cord, and pain was being perceived. So now what does the brain do? Start sending back signals that say, block it, okay? Now, does that happen all the time? No. Um, but it, it is possible for our own body to modulate pain signals, to reduce the pain signals. And um, the runner's high, the endorphins, is one example of that. So in a normal, let's look at this, in a normal pain pathway, in a normal pain pathway, what do we have? We've got the nociceptor, right? That is the first order, right? And it is going to stimulate the second order nerve fiber. Here, I've got a substance P. Substance P is the neurotransmitter at this synapse. Now, P, you can remember for pain. Remember I told you every neuron only can release one type of neurotransmitter. So in the case of these nociceptors and these pain neurons, what neurotransmitter do they release? Substance P. And substance P is being released at the synapse between the first and the second order neuron in a pain signal. Okay. Now that substance P is then going to do what? It's going to stimulate the signal to go up the second order neuron up to the spinal thalamic tract. All right, this was the one that I said was normal pain path pathways going up to the brain. There, it'll go as far as the thalamus, and then there'll be another neurotransmitter released, and a third order neuron will travel up to the brain. And if it's going past the thalamus into our cerebrum, then it's also coming into our what? Consciousness, right? If you hear that a signal has reached the cerebral cortex, then it has become aware to us. If it reaches our sensory strip in the parietal lobe, we are aware of that sensation. So that's the normal pathway. Now you're questioning, how does the body know what to do here? Why would it do this? Okay, so now you're hurting, right? The, the brain is receiving these pain signals. And what does it do? Well, it's now going to send signals down from the hypothalamus and the cortex, goes down. Now this is certainly going to be autonomic. You don't choose to release endorphins. Right? You don't choose to release encephalons. This is going to be done as part of your unconsciousness, your autonomic function. And those signals are going to go down, and they're going to go down through the reticular formation and the medulla. They're going to descend, and they're going down serotonin-secreting fibers. Okay, So they're going down the spinal cord. They're serotonin-secreting analgesic fibers. They're going down to the spinal cord and they're going to terminate at the, sp the posterior horn. So let's figure out if we can see this in a picture in a moment. And then what's going to happen here is that there, these fibers are now going to be able to release their products and modulate, modify, change the action potentials and the signals that are being sent. So they're going to come down to the posterior horn and synapse onto some interneurons. What do they release? They were what? Serotonin, right? So they were going to release serotonin. Now, what did they do? The serotonin's now synapsed onto a second order pain fiber, second order pain neuron, right? And these are the ones that will release encephalins. Whoa, it, it, it's a lot of going on here, but we'll look at a picture here in a moment. Now, what this is going to do now is allow for the substance P to be interfered with. What was substance P? Okay. Substance P was the nociceptor neurotransmitter, and what's this encephalon going to do? It's going to block that substance P from being able to travel up the spinal cord to the thalamus by what we call the spinal gating, okay? Now, that's one thing that's going on. We'll look at a picture in a moment. Another thing is maybe we understand better is that if you just rub or massage an injury, it feels good, okay? This is not just psychosomatic. 
This is physiological. When you rub or massage in an area that hurts, you actually are doing this. You're actually bringing in, you're receiving mechanoreceptors from the skin, and this will actually cause pain-inhibiting neurons, okay? And so you will actually start secreting kephalons from the site of injury. So my leg hurts. Okay, mommy, rub it. Right? Somebody rubbed my leg. I feel better now. It, it's not just here in your head. You actually, by mechanically massaging that area, are releasing encephalons. You're not waiting for the brain to send them. You're actually sending them out locally from, um, from that part of your body that is hurting. Now, let's take a look at this diagram. If you like um, electrical diagrams, this, you might like this kind of, of image. So let's take a look. Let me break this down for us. And again, this is coming out of your Saladin book. And you can read the steps over here in greater detail. This is 16.5 in your book. So you just, for whatever reason, put your finger on a flame. You've just activated a nociceptor. And that nociceptor is going to go to the, this big old thing, the big old egg here, is the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. They made it really large. So what's going to be released right there at number one? We're going to release substance P. Substance P is going to be picked up and is going to go by one of two ways. If it's going up the spinal thalamic track, right, it's going to travel up and go to the thalamus and then synapse and go up to your cerebral cortex, specifically to your sensory strip, saying, ouch, that hurts. You also could be sending signals up um, the reticular spinal tract, but that's not shown here. But what happens in response to your pain, your cerebral cortex and your hypothalamus are going to send signals, and they're going to go back to uh, the midbrain area, if you will, and come back down through the medulla oblongata, and come down, and what are they going to do? They're going to come down and directly release, right here, the first one, number six, this was the serotonin. So it comes down, releases some serotonin. Then the second one comes down and releases what? The, the second order pain fiber would now be releasing the encephalin. Okay. And it's releasing it here at the synapse. Can you picture what's happening here? I'm going to clear this off. It tells you what neurotransmitters are being released at each of those based upon color. Again, I know this is impossible to study off your little notes. So if this story is making sense to you in words, great. You might want to look at the picture just to confirm you understand the flow of information. If this story is not making sense to you in words, you definitely want to study the picture first. Make sure that this makes sense to you as you go back and look at the verbiage that I've described. Okay. So that would be a pain pathway, right? Three neurons in a row, and we've learned how the nervous system can also feed back and modulate, inform, change the signal through encephalons and endorphins. What do we think? Overall story, okay. A few details to pick up and memorize, but the overall story is okay. Absolutely. Are, the question is, are there neurotransmitters being released here in the thalamus? Well, you better believe it, because every synapse is going to involve neurotransmitters. Um, as far as what they are, I don't recall, okay? I, I don't recall offhand what specifically the neurotransmitter is here. It's not one of the three that we're discussing here, okay? So just know there is a neurotransmitter being released, activates that third-order neuron, sends a signal from the thalamus up to the sensory strip. Cool stuff, right? Mommy rub it, it hurts. It's, it, it's good stuff. So that's our sense of touch, right? I didn't go into a lot of detail. I didn't go into the different kinds of receptors, the Pacinian corpuscles and the Raffini corpuscles and some of those things that we discussed in 105. But now we're really focusing on, you know, what are the neurons and what are the pathways that bring these pain signals, these touch signals up to the brain? Any questions on touch, specifically pain? Again, there's fast and slow, and that didn't get teased out here, Mary, but there are fast signals, which are going to be fast 
throbbing, painful, sharp pains, or there could be slower pathways that are more diffuse pain. And then I think your question is, how long are the endorphins released? I, I don't know the, the answer offhand. The question is, how long does the body continue to release endorphins? How long can it fight off a, a, a bad situation, right, a really painful situation? And I don't know um, if this is a uh, continual uh, release or if it's just a short-term release. Um, I don't know. I'm hoping it's long enough, though, until the EMS can get there and give me some morphine, right? Whatever, right? Whatever it is, I hope, I hope it's, it's enough until more help can, more, more backups can come in, right? Okay. Okay, so that's, uh, that's touch and pain. Let's go on to taste. Not a lot here to focus on. Most of this should be somewhat, I hope, familiar to you. So you eat. You bring molecules into your oral cavity on your tongue. As you know, there are taste buds. Those taste buds have a little uh, opening down into that taste bud called a taste pore. And there, there are five primary types of receptors that can perceive different tastes. There are salty, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami. Okay, now each of these is triggered by different molecules. So they're all chemoreceptors that are specifically turned on by different molecules. So there are salty, and these are turned on by the metals like sodium and potassium. Okay. There are sweet carbs, glucose, sucrose. Those simple sugars are going to trigger your chemoreceptors. Uh, that also give you a sense of sweetness. Um, sour, citrus fruits, lemon. But what molecule, so let's go back, what molecule do we know is involved? This one already told us, right? Sodium and potassium can give us a sense of saltiness. If someone's on a sodium-restricted diet, they can still get their sense of salt by what? Salt substitute is potassium chloride. So rather than sodium chloride, where the sodium becomes a problem for the person, they can pour on some potassium chloride. It's not exactly the same, but it does give you a sense of saltiness without driving up your sodium levels. So both sodium and potassium drive or give you the sense of saltiness. Glucose, sugars, right, for sweet. Uh, how about sour? Acids, when you hear the word acid, you're thinking hydrogen, hydrogen right? So H plus is the trigger for your acid or your sour. Bitter. Um, nicotine, caffeine, quinine, morphine, uh, these are all uh, trigger the bitter uh, responses. Uh, spoiled foods also typically trigger that bitter re reflex. Not something we choose typically to trigger, the bitter reflexes. And then umami is triggered actually by amino acids, um, specifically glutamate is one of them. So glutamate is one of the 20 amino acids. And so when glutamate is on the tongue, you get this sense of savory or meatiness that was described by a Japanese group. So we're stuck with their name, umami, which translates into savory or meaty from Japanese. Okay. So where, where do we see this glutamate in restaurants? Yeah, MSG. What does MSG do? It's a food additive to make things taste better, right? So you're actually triggering your umami uh, you're triggering sodium, it's usually MSG, monosodium glutamate, so it's a salty as well as a meaty sensation that they're adding to the food. A lot of your food has MSG in it. Um, and um, just as an aside, what American food has all five taste sensations? Yeah, ketchup, right? So ketchup, um, maybe the, maybe the uh, hunts and the, uh, oh, who am I thinking of? The Heinz and the Hunts people knew this, right? But all five of those sensations are given to you through, through ketchup. So uh, we, taste is not just about chemoreceptors. It's about texture. Anybody here have aversions to certain foods, not because of their taste, but because of how they feel in your mouth, right? Texture, seeds, or shrimp. I'm hearing, you know, think, just different things. Right? We all have different sensitivities, perhaps. So taste is, it is chemical. It is... Uh, texture, it is uh, appearance, right? That looks gross or that smells horrible. It may taste better than it smells. So we know there's a lot more going on. Uh, temperature, 
Now, if you bite into a habanero and you have this taste of pain, um, habaneros don't stimulate any of your taste sensations. They actually trigger nociceptors. So really hot peppers stimulate, uh, there isn't a sixth, pain, a sixth sense of spicy, right? You don't see spicy on the list. So really, really spicy is actually triggering the pain receptors. Okay. Now, I have to apologize. I, everything I read, I, I, I keep reading different things on the distribution of taste receptors. Some books I read that, oh, we know that salty and sweet are on the tip of your tongue. In fact, I already mentioned that. If someone has seventh cranial nerve damage, they won't taste sweet and salty very well, as well as having facial paralysis. Other books I pick up say, no, there really isn't a true mapping of the taste buds anywhere on your tongue. They're really more localized back toward the back of the tongue. I, I can't seem to narrow it down. If you come across something more authoritative, let me know. But regardless, here I'm telling you that there are regional differences in taste buds, in different sensations. And I was always taught that um, bitter sensations, poisons are often bitter, they're more toward the back of the tongue, and that was thought to initiate the gag reflex. So if you were eating something poisonous or something that could be potentially harmful to you, not only did it taste horrible, but it would trigger your <coughs> gag and get rid of it, right? To not let it enter your body. It makes sense to me, but there's also, I've read some things where it does not suggest that everything is quite so mapped out on the tongue. Let me know what you find out. Now, there's two different ways that taste uh, triggers, right? So we're talking about these are chemoreceptors. And when sodium or these chemicals come onto the contact, what are they going to do? Activate the nerve, right? And send off an action potential. So how does it happen? Well, two of these um, actually depolarize the cells directly. Now, we know what that word depolarize means. We haven't used it in a couple days. So if I tell you that sodium and acids, H+, directly depolarize, or de not polarize, depolarize the cell, what does that mean? The presence of sodium or the presence of hydrogen, there are gates that open, right? Same old story. Sodium comes rushing in. Oh, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? So sodium on my tongue, that sodium directly goes into the, the taste cell and sets up a what? A depolarizing event. We're not surprised by that. Hydrogen's the same way because hydrogen's what charge? H+. Plus. So again, hydrogen is welcomed into that particular receptor and starts up a direct depolarizing event. Action potential goes. Now the other ones, sugars, the bitter alkaloids, and the glutamate for umami, they're first, first going to bind to a receptor which is then going to activate another mechanism called a G-protein second messenger system. I'll show you a picture of this, the specific details of which I don't want you to worry about. What I do want you to know is that the sugars, alkaloids, and glutamate go through a second system, whereas the sodium and the hydrogen um, directly penetrate and set up the depolarizing event. Now, where does this go? Okay. So this is always kind of fun to think about, again, this idea of pathway. So once you have sugar, salt, sweet, doesn't matter what it is, once you've activated the sensation of taste, where is it going? It's going to go through one of two different cranial nerves. When are they? Sense of taste is going to be seven or nine. And those signals are going to travel where? To the medulla oblongata to a nucleus called the solitary nucleus, okay? However you want to think about this, right? Maybe you eat in solitary, whatever, right? But your sensation of taste goes to a nucleus in the, in the medulla called the solitary nucleus. From here, okay, it's going to split in two places. It's going to go to the hypothalamus and the amygdala, hmm, and it's going to go to the thalamus and then go up to the post-central gyrus. So let's think about this. Why would taste go to the amygdala? Because taste can make you feel good or make you feel bad. 
right? So definitely flavor and taste is going to inform your emotional centers of your brain. Mm -mm, this is good or this is disgusting. It's also, though, going to go to your thalamus, which is then going to relay up to your cortex, and it's going to tell you that, oh, okay, I'm now aware of this. It's going up to your post-central gyrus. You know that as the sensory strip, right? And from there, it's also going to go to the orbital frontal cortex, which is basically a, a funny way of saying right behind, uh, sort of up where your nose and your eyes come together. Let's take a look at the cells and then look at this pathway. So the olfactory cells, okay, they are neurons. They are the only neurons that are directly, if you will, exposed to the environment. So what does that suggest to you about these cells? They must be, since they're exposed to the environment, they would be very prone to damage, right? Um, actually, I, I'm flipping over on it. I'm backing up. That's taste. We're done. Sorry. So that's taste, OK? Now we're going over to smell, OK? Jump to the next sentence. So anything on taste, we didn't learn a whole lot, just the five different senses and the different molecules that are going to pick those senses up. Let's pull it together, though, with smell. So these are the olfactory cells. Uh, these are neurons, OK? Um, they have little olfactory hairs. Now, I, I don't like the nomenclature here. They, they refer to them as cilia, and they refer to them as hairs. Neither one is what we think of first. They're not cilia-like things beating to move gunk out of your respiratory system, and they aren't hairs like a pillus on your head or your body. They are instead just simply nerve endings. Yes, sir, Dan. Come, let me come back to that. The question was, taste bud or nose, which one was I referring to as being the only uh, nerves directly exposed to the environment? Let me come back to that, OK? I don't want to step into that too, too deep, OK? I will clarify, though. Um, now, what do these molecules sense? What, sorry, what do these nerve endings sense? They are also chemoreceptors. Whereas in taste, there were only five basic flavors, if you will. Uh, in smell, there are far more uh, nerve endings, types of nerve endings. And there are different binding sites for different odorant or different chemo molecules. And again, these cilia are non-modal. So they're not there moving. They're just simply there receiving chemicals, like a big, thick, tangled mass of, of these receptors. Uh, collectively, we call this the first cranial nerve. There we go. It's smell, okay? So they're the only neurons directly exposed to the external environment because in the taste bud, the, the neurons are down deep within the taste uh, bud. Here, these guys are actually, those, these hair cells are literally dangling out in the mucus, uh, the nasal mucosa, so they are exposed to the internal, external, sorry, the external environment. So they, only, they have a short lifespan. Now, that's true of the taste buds as well. But here, the olfactory cells also have a relatively short lifespan. They're being replaced constantly. So you'll hear discussion as you look at the details here. You'll see basal cells. Well, the basal cells are the cells that are sort of like the, the germ cells or the stem cells that can continue to regenerate these cells. Um, there are supporting cells, basal cells. And I'm not going to get excited about them. One supports, one is the stem cell. Now, what you're seeing here, uh, this will come back for, oops, this will come back for lab. You're looking here. These cells are coming down. And the, the, hairs, the hairs or the cilia, however you want to think about them, are coming down through. And they're coming down through these openings in the ethmoid bone. Those little openings you'll name in lab as the olfactory foramina. Remember what foramina? Foramen, many foramina, openings. And this big yellow guy up here represents what? That big yellow guy up there actually represents a portion of the entire olfactory bulb. That is the first nerve. And it comes forward like a big antenna. 
and down through these little foramina, these cilia are traveling down and are receiving odor molecules. Okay. So we have a relatively poor sense of smell, although I was just reading in a science news kind of magazine last month that they are now describing our smell as being more developed than what we thought, and yet it's still a lot worse than other animals. So I'm not sure what the point of the article was. Um, I mean, we still don't have great sense of smell compared to other animals, no matter how complex it might be. Um, so again, the molecules that we smell must get through the mucus. So if you're clogged up, if you've got a cold, you know you don't smell as well because those molecules have to get up through those layers of gunk, right, that are blocking those hair cells. Um, if you have a molecule that is more hydrophobic, okay, let's think about these words. Um, hydrophobic would be transported more easily. Hydrophilic molecules, water-based molecules, would have to migrate through the mucus. Um, so if you want to smell something, what kind of odors kind of punch through the mucus? Menthol, mints, peppermints, right? They, they can kind of permeate through. So you get this, oh, I can smell things differently, right? It kind of break, it can get through the mucus more easily. So a uh, peppermint kind of thing, uh, mint, menthol, those kinds of things can push through those, those uh, smells, through the mucus more easily. Now, these are going to be, uh, again, a combination of either G proteins, that is the second messenger type system, or um, open ion channels. And again, look at this. This makes sense. I think that the molecules that can drive directly into a depolarizing event are positively charged ions, right? So if it's a sodium or a calcium, it's able to directly go into the cell, cause the depolarizing event, and send the action potential down. But if it's a molecule that can't directly enter or does not have a positive charge, then it works instead through these G protein mechanisms. These signals travel really, really fast, but the olfactory nerve tends to adapt quickly. And the other word for this is to say that it is phasic, right? So the olfactory nerve is highly phasic. That is, it tends to phase out, no longer is sending, at least not to your consciousness, the smell anymore. Now, it is true that if your next-door neighbor really, really stinks, it's not like bad odor, like really bad odor. You, you don't get used to really bad odor, right? So my 12-year-old in the backseat after a ball game, right, uh, there aren't enough air fresheners. So what happens? Those, those, stink, those stinks are actually hitting nociceptors on your trigeminal. So when you smell something that really, really stinks and it just won't go away, you know, rotten fish or, you know, teenagers or whatever, um, then you're actually hitting nerve endings, no nociceptors on the trigeminal. Now, other molecules that hit these same nociceptors, I already mentioned to you in taste, but uh, Payson, this is the hot pepper molecule chlorine, right? You're going down through Walmart or Meyer and you go through the pool area this time of the year and they get all the chlorine tablets stacked to the roof. There, there's a smell there that just kind of is irritating, isn't it? Um, to me, anyway. Uh, ammonia, again, uh, will really perk you up. Menthol, these are things that, that um, can pass through and also actually hit the nociceptors, giving you a, a, an alertness. Now, do we create pheromones as humans? It used to be argued that only animals gave out pheromones, that we were, quote, above that. But it is true that humans do give off pheromones, body odors, that are perceived by us largely unconsciously. Um, and those pheromones can have effects on um, sexual behavior, uh, effects on vaginal and, and sweat glands. Um, women who, who tend to room together tend to start cycling together, again, thinking through pheromones. So uh, we know that there's definitely signals out there that, that influence each other. Um, and those uh, vaginal secretions, uh, copulines is a name for those secretions that 
are involved, but they also are known to raise uh, testosterone levels. So not only are they um, working to um, influence ovulation amongst a group of women, but they also are known to influence men as well. So pheromones, definitely a part of the human experience. Okay, let's talk about the pathway of smell. So we are going to start uh, the axons, all these cilia, all these nerves are going to go up and form the olfactory tract. Why am I not calling it the olfactory nerve? Yeah, so once the optic, let's go back to the eye, I think we know that one better. Once the optic nerve leaves the eye and gets into the brain, it changes names to the optic tract, right? And it's the optic, and then um, the olfactory nerve is no different. So the olfactory nerve, all those cilia, all those hair cells are coming in, and they're going to form what's known as the optic tract. And where is it going? Where is it going? Those signals are going to go to the primary olfactory cortex, which is the temporal lobe. But where else is smell going? Hippocampus. Why? When I say hippocampus, you think formation of memories. When I say amygdala, you're thinking fear, good, bad. When I say hypothalamus, What we've talked about is thirst for sure, right, in the hypothalamus. Uh, how about the insula? We know the insula is involved with some taste and smell. And the orbital frontal cortex, I mentioned that earlier, also for taste. So are taste and smell connected in the brain? Yes. Are they connected via the cranial nerves? Not really. I mean, smell is cranial nerve one. Taste is seven and nine, right? You plug your nose, it's true you don't taste as well. But it's not because when you plug your nose, you're somehow influencing cranial nerve seven or nine, right? It's because in the brain, it is perceived, it, the information comes together in the brain, in some of the same parts of the brain. Now we know that smell, now look at this, smell does not go through what? What area have we said before, when things went to your consciousness, everything before now went through the thalamus? you won't see, smell does not travel through the thalamus. It's one of the quirky little distinctions. But smell does not go through the thalamus. It goes directly to the temporal lobe. So again, can smells make you feel good, make you angry, elicit emotional responses, help form memories? Right? We know that smell is more memory um, forming. There's another, another word for it. Smell elicits more memories than visual. You can smell something and it will bring back memories more easily than even visual recollection. Okay, so we know that smell is very, very potent in your memories and in helping to for formulate your memories. Now again, there are some cells back there, the granule cells. I'm not going to get excited about those. But um, we do know that some food smells more appetizing when you're hungry right? And there might be some um, uh, modulation going on in your smell. Now let's take a look at the olfactory projection pathways. So where is it all coming from? The olfactory bulb. We're way up here, right? We're way up here. Looks like, oops, it looks like little antenna, doesn't it? So there's little antenna. There they are. That's going to be your first order neuron, right? And it's going to go where? It's going straight to this region called the, we can call it the olfactory cortex, the part of the brain that receives this. And some of it crosses over, some of it stays on the same side, so some of it decussates. And then where does it go from there? That information is going to synapse and go to your hippocampus, memory. It's going to synapse and go to your amygdala or emotions. It's going to go to your insula. It's going to go all the way up to your orbital frontal cortex. Again, it's up in the frontal lobe, really close to where the um, olfactory nerve is, but it's also way up front in the um, frontal cortex. And, oh yeah, it also went back to your, what? Hypothalamus. 
So these are called, called the projection pathways, where this information is going within your brain. And now that you know a little bit more about the amygdala and the hippocampus, right, it makes sense to you that smell influences your emotions, smell can influence your memories and elicit memories. Let's stop there for a few minutes, just about a six minute break or so, and we'll finish on with sound. Okay, a couple people told me that I was losing them, right, the last few minutes, so, so let's think about it. What do we know about um, smell? Just talk to me. What do we know about smell? What's the pathway? Chemoreceptors in the mucosa are going to receive uh, chemical, odorant molecules. Those signals are going to go where? They're first going to go to the olfactory nerve and then the olfactory tract on the way to what's called the primary olfactory cortex. That's just a simple name of saying the part of the brain that receives smell. And then that area is going to go to influence your emotions, your learning, your memory, um, your overall sense of well-being, um, and some of the insula, and it also goes to the hypothalamus. Remember, it does not go to the thalamus, right? So this is unusual. Everything else went through the thalamus at some point. Smell is the exception. Okay, let's get on to sound here, uh, hearing. And we may or may not have time to get to balance. We'll see how it goes. And uh, now we're switching cranial nerves, right? Now we're cranial, cranial nerve number eight, right? The vestibular cochlear nerve. And I'm not going to review the, the air, sorry, I'm not going to review with you the anatomy of the ear, but just recall that we do have the outer ear up to the tympanic membrane, the middle ear, which is a air filled chamber typically that has the three ossicles within it. In lab, we mentioned conduction hearing loss. That is a type of hearing loss where either the membrane's not vibrating or maybe the signal's not being sent through the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, and that would lead to a conduction type of deafness. And then once you lift up on the stapes, there is behind it the, what window? Oval window, and now you're in the inner ear. In the inner ear, one finds the cochlea, as well as the vestibular apparatus and the semicircular canals. And we see that both of these systems, the vestibular and the cochlear systems, are uh, innervated by the same cranial nerve, branches of the same cranial nerve number eight. They collectively go off, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So the basis of sound is that waves are going to come in, and these waves are going to have two different uh, characteristics. One, they are going to have a different frequency. That is, these waves are going to come in at a different hertz or different cycles per second, how often they're coming in. That wave right, is vibrating and it's frequency. Now, the frequency is going to inform you and your nervous system about the pitch of the sound. So if it's a high frequency wave, you will perceive it as a higher pitch. If it's a low frequency wave, you will perceive it as a lower pitch. Now for us as humans, we have a range of 20 to 20,000 hertz or 20 to 20,000 cycles per second. That's another definition of a hertz, a cycle per second. And that's the maximum, right? So we're able, our eardrum and our ear is able to perceive sounds on those extreme ranges. Now, not most people don't have the extreme ranges. We've lost it or we had damage or something going on, but that's the extreme uh, range. Now, infrasonic, right, below, right, infra below would be the ability to hear things below 20. Ultrasonic would be to hear things above 20,000. That's our dog, right? The dog whistle, that high frequency sound. We know other animals are able to hear in those frequencies, we don't hear them. Now, our speech is mostly between 1,500 and 5,000. So our hearing is most sensitive in that range, from 1,500 to 5,000. If you had losses above 6,000, you would probably be able to carry on a conversation and hear somebody just fine. There are some sounds you wouldn't hear well, but you could, you could hear speech pretty well. 
but if you had a hearing loss specifically in that range between 1,500 and 5,000, you would definitely have trouble with perceiving speech and understanding communication. Um, hearing loss with age, um, you know, you'll start definitely seeing some changes um, going up to 250 and then uh, 20 to 2050 hertz uh, is where you really start getting into the hearing areas where you have some problems. Now that's pitch, that's frequency, but how do you perceive the loudness of the sound? This now has to do with another characteristic of the wave, not its frequency, but instead its amplitude, how tall the wave is. So as this wave comes at you, how tall is it? And um, this will be your um, amplitude of the wave. And we're able to perceive sound, and we measure this in decibels. So decibels, dBs, um, is the unit that we use to measure this. Anything over 90 decibels for a prolonged exposure can lead to hearing damage, to uh, neural or nervous hearing damage. So 90 decibels uh, would be a loud concert. Uh, even loud traffic can reach that, but we usually don't hang out there for a long time. Um, but you would definitely want to have protection over your ears if you were in a place over 90 for a long time. Nothing else that come to mind right now, Josh. So the loudness is just the amplitude of the wave, and the pitch is the frequency of the wave. Okay. Maybe something else will come up in a second. So more anatomy, just really quick. We have the middle ear. Again, this is from the tympanic membrane back. Um, there is going to be a lot of nerves in your tympanic membrane. Anyone have a ruptured a nerve? Or sorry, ruptured the tympanic membrane? Very painful. Right? And there, the reason is there are branches of the vagus and of the trigeminal nerves that are innervating the eardrum. So to hit the eardrum with a Q-tip or to have it get uh, um, damaged or to rupture from infection or something like that is very, very painful. The tympanic cavity uh, is continuous uh, and again has the ossicles behind them. The ossicles, here they are to see how small they are sitting on the side of a, size of a penny. These are by far the smallest little bones in your body. We do have upstairs in the lab on the shelf, I don't always remember to put it out, but there is a little uh, plexiglass uh, demonstration of these three ossicles. We have two of them, one, um, two different uh, sets of them upstairs, but it's really remarkable how small they are. You may know them as the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, right? But we'll use anatomical terms, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Uh, otitis media would be a middle ear infection. That is an infection where these ossicles are found. How would the bacteria have, have gotten to the middle ear? Through the eustachian tube, right? The eustachian tube um, is in a children, more horizontal. Those bacteria can come right up the tube, set up an infection there, and that's going to do what? Cause pressure and fluid changes. They're going to push against that highly innervated tympanic membrane. So it's going to hurt. It's also going to make it more difficult to hear because now the malleus, the incus, and the stapes cannot transmit the signal as nicely. So you've got a, a hearing problem as well as uh, some pain that can be involved with these. And uh, we can use a, a scope to look in there and see this. We can also give now tubes, right? And those tubes are going to puncture through the tympanic membrane and allow fluid to drain. So I know the blue here kind of gets difficult, but on the upper left, that is a highly inflamed, lots of blood there, you're seeing it. This is what your tympanic membrane should look like, right? Smooth. Uh, you can actually see the ossicles poking out from the back side of it. Nice and smooth, nice and, you know, not inflamed. And here is a nice nasty infection. Now, once you get past the stapes, you're looking into the inner ear. Um, now you've got some structures that are embedded within the temporal bone. So what's called the bony labyrinth. The labyrinth is a maze. So this bony maze 
And in these bony mazes, you're going to find the cochlea and the semicircular canals embedded within this bone. These uh, labyrinths are fleshy tubes filled with fluid. There's two types of fluid here, endolymph within, right, which is very, very similar to your intracellular fluid, cell fluid inside your cells, right? So endo, endolymph is much like the fluid inside your cells, endo within. And then the perilymph is around the outside, right? And that is very similar to its composition to your CSF or to other extracellular fluids, right? So your CSF is an extracellular fluid. Your CSF is not much different than your plasma. Okay. Now, what you see down here, we'll come back to the anatomy, but on one side, you can see these three semicircular canals. Again, they're filled with fluid. The green is the perilymph, right, on the outside. The blue is the endolymph. And notice that this fluid is connected so the fluid within the cochlea is also connected to the fluid over in the semicircular canals. Back in fluid, when we're talking about fluid levels, um, I remember in passing there was 2% of all of your internal fluids were found in your sort of assorted places. And in that I listed the aqueous humor, the, um, uh, oh, what else? I, I think I mentioned even there the endolymph or the perilymph, some of the fluids of your ear but a very small percentage of fluid, but is there nonetheless. So let's start looking at the structures here again within the inner ear. Here's the nerve, uh, the eighth cranial nerve. Here it is broken down into the vestibular nerve and the cochlear nerve. They do, though, combine to make the vestibular cochlear nerve, right? So as one big nerve, it's the vestibular cochlear. Now, other books have called that or do call that the auditory nerve. So it's not wrong to call the vestibular cochlear nerve also the auditory nerve. Um, the facial nerve travels right next to it. It's, it's a different nerve, obviously, the facial nerve, but it does travel in close proximity to the eighth nerve. So there are some medical conditions where the fifth and the eighth nerve um, sorry, seventh and eighth nerve, facial. Seventh and eighth nerve are both damaged together and can lead to some symptoms. We see the cochlea, right? The cochlea and, again, the semicircular canal. Within the, let's talk about the cochlea specifically. The cochlea is also a fluid-filled chamber separated by membranes, and these membranes are the scala vestibuli, or vestibuli, you'll hear it pronounced both ways. That's the more superior chamber. The tympani is the more inferior chamber. Okay. They are both filled with perilymph. Okay, they're both filled with perilymph. Let's take a look at how this, all, this whole thing goes together. Th so that's the scale of, what was it again? The scale of vestibuli and the tym tympani. Those are both perilymph. Think peripheral, right, on the outside one more superior, one inferior. In between that, there is the scaly oops, media, right in the middle. This is also called the cochlear duct, and this is the chamber filled with the endolymph, right? So think in the center. There are membranes here, the vestibular membrane and the basilar membrane. You'll see this in a moment, how it all goes together. And within the cochlea, there is what's sometimes called the spiral organ. I mentioned it in lab last week as the organ of corti. And this is the more specific, very specific area where the hair cells are within the cochlea that picks up the vibration and initiates the action potential. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, we're kind of diving into the cochlea, and we're breaking in here now the green areas. The green, again, is perilymph. The blue is endolymph. The scaly vestibuli up here, the more superior, and the tympani, the more inferior. And in the very center, this area filled with 
endolymph, the scaly media. Now, very particularly, let me take these markings off, very particularly, I'm going to blow up this little area right here. I'm going to head in. And what we'll see, again, is that there are little hair cells in here. These little hair cells are surrounded by fluid. And what's going to happen here is that as information comes in, sound waves come in, it's going to vibrate that fluid. That, vib that fluid is now going to vibrate and bend some of these hair cells. These hair cells are going to respond by that mechanical bending, right? So they're mechanoreceptors. And we'll see how the bending of them is going to, the, the brain is going to perceive the bending of it based upon the frequency and the amplitude of the wave to give you a sense of pitch and a sense of loudness. Okay. I think it's incredibly cool, but it's a little bit complex. I'll try to break this down as best I can. So in the inner ear, we have these hair cells. They're part of that spiral organ or the organ of cordy. That's the same thing. So when you see spiral organ, organ of corti, same thing. And here there are those hair cells. Those hair cells have a long, stiff microvilli called a stereocilia. This is the worst wording they could ever possibly throw at anyone, you and me, and me included. I hate this verbiage because we're talking about hair cells, and then we talk about cilia, and then we're talking about microvilli. And in the past, we've described those as being very different things. And yet, in this language, they all get thrown together. And it's, it's complicated. It, it's confusing. And I get it. So I, I, I will simply usually just say hair cells. right? Just the hair cells get bent. Um, more specifically, they're saying they're very long microvilli that they call stereocilia. Why would you do that? I don't know. But that's what they've done. Okay. And uh, what we're going to find is that there are four rows of these hair cells. And they're spiraling along the length of the cochlea. Uh, the inner hair cells are going to be your hearing cells. The outer hair cells are going to allow you a greater precision. So we'll say that the inner hair cells are more gross. They're, they're just perceiving the sound. And the inner hairs, or the, sorry, the, that was the inner. The outer hair cells are going to be the, the three rows further in, and they're going to kind of modulate and increase the precision of the sound. Here's a picture. Kind of looks like the underside of your vacuum cleaner, right? Sort of the, 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 the vacuuming brush. You know, maybe here's one set of, of bristles, and here's three more, right? But here are those inner cells. So those are the actual cells that are going to bend, right, in response to fluid movement. And then these are the outer cells. This three layers of cells is going to be more uh, picking up precise changes in the sound. So how does this whole thing work? We've got some anatomy here. We've got the tympanic membrane. You know it as the what? The tympanic membrane is the eardrum, right? And the tympanic membrane is huge compared to the oval window. So what's the oval window? The oval window is that little window be where? Behind the stapes. So sound is being funneled in. That's what I want you to think about. Sound is being funneled in from this tympanic membrane, which is huge, and is funneling in more and more directly down into that little oval window. Those ossicles along the way are concentrating that sound, right, vibrating and bringing it down to a much smaller area. Um, those ossicles are going to be vibrating, and that vibrational energy is going to go in now and vibrate the fluid inside the cochlea. Before we get into the cochlea, though, I want you to know about the tympanic reflex. It's a reflex I did not describe last week. When we're doing lab, we talk about reflexes. We talk about the blink reflex and the pupillary reflex, the Babinski, the Achilles, and the patella reflex. But this is another reflex that involves protection against loud noises. There is a muscle. This muscle is a tensor tympani or tympani. Well, what must it do? During loud noise, this muscle is going to do what? Tense up the tympanic membrane, right? The tensor tympani. So what's it going to do? 
if it's going to tense up the membrane, what would not be allowed to happen as much? It wouldn't be able to vibrate as violently, right? Which is going to save you potentially too loud or too much energy going into the ear. So that's one muscle. Uh, this would be an involuntary muscle, wouldn't it? So this would be a smooth muscle, right? It's not like being a voluntary muscle, because voluntary muscle is the one that you have choices over. So it would be a smooth muscle, so we don't only find smooth muscle around the gut. But this is any kind of muscle that we don't have direct control over. So this is, an, this is a smooth muscle. And then also, the stapedius muscle. It's another muscle, and this one, it's also part of your reflexes, so what's it gonna do? It's going to pull back on the stapes and therefore what? Not allow as much vibrational energy to go through the, where am I? Into the oval window, right? So we're going to pull back on the ossicle and we're going to stiffen up the, the tympanic membrane. Both of these are going to be reflexive. Now, both of these are going to help us um, uh, minimize damage to our ear but they can't happen instantaneously. You have to be approaching a loud sound gradually so that these two muscles can do their business and protect your hearing. If you were to be suddenly exposed to a gunshot or to a loud boom, these muscles could not respond quickly enough to save you, so you might sustain some nerve damage, some hearing loss from those loud sounds. These are also the muscles that help you um, um, dampen the sound of your own speech. You don't hear yourself as loud, do you? As if you were standing right in front of yourself, you'd hear much louder. So let's take a look at these uh, stimulation of these hair cells. So again, uh, out here we're dealing with, these are sound waves, and they're coming in, and we're bouncing off the tympanic membrane. That energy is going to be sent through this looks like a, a crane, if you will, right, or a lever, but those, that lever represents the three ossicles, right, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. We're concentrating that energy, too, from a bigger area to a smaller surface area. And right here, this opening is the oval window. Now we're inside the inner ear. Forget about the vestibular stuff right now. We're just focusing on the movement of this fluid, and there's a basal or membrane in here, and as, this, as these sound waves come in, they're going to bend the membrane, and that, that's now going to uh, influence right, the hair cells. So these hair cells are going to move along with the membrane. Okay. Again, as many as 20,000 times per second. Remember, our, our hearing range was what? 20 to 20,000 hertz. That's another way of saying it. The membrane would be vibrating 20,000 times per second for us to hear the maximum high frequency that our ears can hear. Whereas the lowest sounds we can hear, those waves are only doing 20 times per second, but that's still pretty, pretty <coughs> impressive, right? Now, what's actually going on here? We know about action potentials. We know that typically, up until now, Sodium has always been the magic molecule, right? Sodium, sodium, sodium. Sodium comes in. Sodium causes a depolarization, da-da-da-da-da. In the cochlea, the endolymph, which you know more as a what? Endolymph is more like what? Go back. The endolymph is more like the intracellular fluid, which is always what? Higher end. Potassium, nothing's changed, right? So what happens is the stereocilia in the, in, the, in the hair cells are surrounded by endolymph. Endolymph is like our intracellular fluid, which is high in potassium. And this creates a resting membrane potential, okay? And just keep that in mind right now. And what's going to happen is that these gates are mechanically gated ion channels. That means that they're going to be opened in response to what? Mechano. They're, me they're, mecha they're mechano or mechanically gated channels. 
So they're going to open in response to mechanical touch, right? Vibration. And when they open up, what's going to fly in? Potassium. That's different. In the past, we've talked about sodium rushing in. But this fluid around these hair cells is endolymph, which is high in potassium. And the flowing in of those gates causes the depolarization. That's different, isn't it? We've always talked about sodium. But here it's actually potassium that flows in that causes the depolarizing event. Now what caused, um, back up, what happened to cause those mechanical gates to open? Right, there was a bending, a, a vibration of the basilar membrane. The basilar membrane is now going to tip those little hair cells over. And as those hair cells tip over, that's physically the mechano event that opens up the gate. Potassium rushes in, depolarizes the cell, stimulates the action potential. Looking at it here, in an unstimulated situation, that is, there's no sound wave coming in, these stereocilia, hate the word, we'll call them hair cells, right, are standing erect. They're just sitting there. They're not bent. The gates are closed. Down here, it tells us the potassium gate is closed when the hair cells are just standing there erect. Sound waves comes in. Sound wave is going to cause this basilar membrane to vibrate and for these, stereocil uh, these stereocilia to be bent. As they bend, it literally opens the gate, mechanical, mechanically gated. So as they are pushed over, it causes the potassium gate to open. Potassium comes rushing into the cell and causes a what? Depolarization and an action potential. That information is going to be sent, as we well know, down our eighth cranial nerve. So a little video for you to watch. It's really kind of cool. This uh, cochlea has sort of been unwound a little bit, if you will. It's not quite as round. But right here, there's your stapes. And come, oop. Right, there's your stapes. There's your oval window coming in. That basilar membrane is going to be vibrated. And, um, and then the energy that leaves the ear will leave out the... There's a window right here called the round window, the round window. So re watch that little video. It's worthwhile. Now, a couple minutes just to go over this pathway. What's the coding? What's the, the pathway for hearing? Again, loudness of sound was perceived by the amplitude of the wave, right? How tall the wave is. Soft sounds, the wave is not very high. Large sounds, right, high, high in loudness, will be higher amplitude. When it comes to pitch, I've already mentioned to you that pitch is based upon how fast the wave is vibrating, the frequency, which is measured in units of hertz. It turns out that at the distal end of the cochlea, it is wider and more flexible and is more prone to being bent at low-pitched sounds, whereas at the basilar end, at the front end, the membrane is more stiff, and it takes more vibrational energy to shake that basilar section. So the front end of the cochlea is more responsible to high pitch, and the further you go into the cochlea, it's easier for the low-pitched sounds to vibrate. So that means that if I were to stretch the cochlea out, right? So this is the cochlea stretched out in a straight line. Up here at the very top, this is a stiffer membrane. It takes a greater frequency of the waves to trigger that movement. So that means that waves that trigger this part of the membrane are higher frequency. As we go down deeper in the cochlea, it gets easier to vibrate. So down here, lower frequency waves would be vibrating the fluid and the basilar membrane at the distal end. So if you're looking at overall uh, frequencies, as you go deeper into the cochlea, high frequency sounds, right, more up toward the front, medium in the middle, more like your speech area, 
and then deepen the deep in the cochlea would be the low frequency sounds. So we've mentioned two different kinds of deafness, conductive versus neuro deafness. Again, uh, conductive deaf deafness would be what? Anything that doesn't allow the vibration of the sound wave to get to the inner ear, problems with the ossicles, problem with the tympanic membrane, whereas Sensoroneural or neural deafness would be an issue with the actual hair cells, death of those hair cells no longer responding to the waves. So we'll pick up with the auditory projection pathway. That is, how does sound go from the ear and where does it go in the brain? And we'll also finish up with balance and vision on Thursday. We're exactly halfway through. There's about 120 slides in this chapter. We're at 65, so we're, we're right where we need to be, probably to finish up all this information. Remember, there are three lecture quizzes that are all due by next Sunday night, this coming Sunday night, one on fluids, one on the neuron and the action potential, one now on the senses. Last thing, guys, let me just say this into the speaker and then to you. I messed up. There was a five-point connect quiz that ideally was open for you last week for you to practice to be even better prepared for today or this week's lab exam. I messed up. I realized that last night. I posted it. Some of you noticed it. Some of you didn't notice it. Again, I was saying it over there earlier. Go on to connect and do that quiz before lab next week. Just do that little quiz online. It'll help you either prepare. If you have exam on Thursday, you definitely might want to do it in advance of the exam. Maybe it'll help you a little bit.